Well, happy Sunday. I am coming at you uh, live from Stockton, California, where I'm visiting with a church client to complete a security risk assessment. So I flew in late last night, went to the church service today, which was absolutely uh, incredible. The, the service blew me away. It's always an honor for me and a privilege when I get to see different churches from around the country as to how they worship. And I always consider that I'm blessed at my own church. Um, but I go to some churches that just blow me away. And, and today, this church in um, Stockton uh, was an incredible service. So I was honored to be uh, part of it. So I thought I'd just jump in because I'm sat in my hotel room and I'm working on a few things. So I thought I'd jump in and um, share some stuff with you. The first thing that I want to talk about, really excited, let me try and hold this up so you can see this. I just finished reading this on the plane. The manuscript for my latest book is ready. And the latest book is how to talk to your leader about church security. When I first started the journey, it was going to be called How Do You Talk to Your Pastor About Church Security? But in getting some feedback, early feedback, and in my research, I realized that I needed to sort of take it more holistically and just say church leader than just pastor. So um, I was on a four hour plane flight from Minneapolis to California yesterday in commute. So I read through it on the plane. I've got some final revisions. I'm going to sit here now for the next couple of hours and tweak. Um, so I am ready to solicit some feedback. I think it's a strong final draft. If there is someone out there that would like to um, proofread the book, um, drop the word book in the comments uh, and I will reach out to you about um, talking how you can do that. Um, or you can send me a DM. Now I've got to be very honest with you. When I ask for feedback and I send documents, I know people get busy, they get distracted, or the task isn't quite what they thought, and they don't always necessarily um, follow through. And I, I say that with a kind servant's heart. So um, if you put the word book in the comments below or send me a DM, um, I'd love to just have a quick chat with you as to what the project actually entails. So I think you can read the book in like two hours and then it's just providing any feedback to me. So I'm really looking for most probably 10 people that can read the books and give some well-rounded um, feedback. Uh, take around two hours, but I, I would love you to, as always, to take action and follow through. So if you feel that you're committed and you'd like a sneak peek of the book and be able to shave the book as well, as yeah, I just... Um, my graphic designer actually lives in Argentina, and I was just messaging with him back and forth um, for um, cover ideas. So I know he'll be working this week to get those done. So there's a, a lot of exciting things that you'll be able to help sort of shape the book as we go through there. So put book in the comments or send me a DM. Uh, something else I want to share with you is that um, this week, I recorded a webinar. Let me try and get this up on the screen here. Um, how do I do this now? My Mac here. Um, this week, I recorded a webinar. So for a security hardware company called Graybar, you might have heard of them, the national company, huge. They, they sell um, technologies hardware. Um, they invited me to a webinar series that they were doing for school security and what they wanted me to sort of talk about for 10-15 minutes was what are the common pitfalls that I see with emergency response plans for schools. So outside of House of Worship, I do a lot of secular work and also do a lot of school work, emergency preparedness. And so it was a really interesting conversation. And I thought to myself, what are the three common pitfalls that me and my team see in and around school emergency operations plans. And so I want to talk with you a little bit today about what those were. And perhaps you might see these in your house of worship. Um, so I would love for you to give some feedback below. So the, the three things that I came up with 
were not covering all the scenarios. And I'm going to tell you a little bit more about that in a moment, but I just want to go through the three that I saw. So it's not covering all the scenarios. Assuming that people, i.e. teachers, know the plan, and then a failure to debrief and improve. So let's take them one by one as we go through. And remember, I spoke about this for schools, but I'm now going to change it for houses of worship. So one of the things that I find when I talk to schools is that they don't cover all the scenarios. And I know that houses of worship are the same. So what do I mean by this? Well, most often, when we are practicing our virtual operations plan, and particularly staying on the school theme for a second, what will happen is that they will practice a fire drill or lockdown drill when kids are in the classroom or when they're in the library or when they might be um, outside in the play area. And what often people fail to do is that they don't widen the scenario to include those, what in England we call sod's law. In America here, it's Murphy's law. Most often, these things will not occur when the kids are sat in the classroom. So to really practice and build muscle memory, I find that schools and churches, well, they don't practice when the alarm bells just uh, rang and when the kids are leaving the classroom, transitional area. The run high fight, government run high fight, believe it's by the Houston Police Department started that scheme. They designed run high fight for people being in transitional areas. Uh, and I'll go to open areas within a school where people are studying and they won't do a lockdown drill when the kids are in these open areas. So when I said about not covering all scenarios, what I really meant was that we're not practicing in different types of environment. We're sticking to, well, it's worship service or we're sticking to the kids are in school. So as you're planning your emergency response uh, scenarios, your testing of your plan, it's really important that you widen the scenario and think, well, well what happens if we're, um, people are leaving the church or people are just coming inside the church? What does that mean? Or it's the weekday and the offices um, are closed and people are walking downstairs. So it's really change the scenario. Don't just have it that someone sat at their desk or people are sat down in a worship center and then you need to evacuate for um, severe weather, say, or a medical emergency. Because as I mentioned, in England, Sod's Law, here in America, Murphy's Law, that is most probably not when the emergency is going to take place. So make sure that you're covering those, as my friend Tina Rose says, the um, what if scenarios. What if this happens? What are we going to do? And the second thing that I find, and again, I spoke about this for schools but I want to transition to, to churches. Now, the second thing that I find that with schools and with churches is that there is an assumption that some people know the plan. And I spoke to um, a church about a month ago, um, and they had, uh, they had a school, they had a preschool, they had the church. There was also a, a second building. I can't remember what they had in the second building, but they had a second building. And then the person showed me like the emergency plans and there was almost like a plan for a different environment. And the sort of the director of facilities who oversaw security, they sort of said, Simon, we've got a plan for each different location. I, I don't even know what the plans are. Even I get confused. You know, can, can your organization at Kingswood, can you help us streamline and centralize all this and i think that's the key learning point in there because sometimes we have so many plans or there's so much information out there but we assume that people know the answers and when i spoke about this for schools superintendents um head of school if it's a private christian school people assume well the leader went through the training or they know where to get the emergency operations plan. But I say, but yeah, but does Simon 
know the plan? Does he really know what is expected of him? And I think what we often find is that people go through the training and they um, they comprehend, but they don't necessarily know how to execute, which is really important. So uh, for your church plan, assumptions that people know the plan, they've gone for a training, you've really got to sit them down and make sure and understand do, do they know what to do in that emergency? Yes, they know that it's on the shared drive. Yes, they've got the folder and they know where it is. Um, but really, don't assume people know. Continue to educate, continue to test, continue to um, cross-check that actually people know what is the expectation of them. Uh, and then the final thing that I spoke about, remember I was talking about the three things, I'm holding four fingers up there, but the three things that I find in schools, and again, this is the same with churches, is in relation to their emergency response plans, they fail to debrief and improve. And I've got to admit, maybe I was a little bit harsh with some schools here because they do do after action reviews and debriefs. But what I find that they do, and this is the same with churches, is that we'll do a test. We will do a tabletop. We will run through a scenario and we'll find those things that haven't worked. We'll find those things where the procedure might need to be changed. But what we then don't do is the improve, which is, okay, so let's assign actions now. Let's say, Simon, you've got this action. Come back in two weeks when that procedure has been changed, when it's been tweaked, when you've then communicated that change, when you've then trained that change, and now that change is back inside our emergency plan so we can then improve. Uh, and I find across churches and schools that if they don't debrief or if they do debrief, what they fail to do is be improved because they'll have a meeting where there's 20, 30 people present and everyone's offering their opinion on the shoulda, woulda, coulda. But what they don't do is they don't follow through, make those changes, get them into the document. Remember, make the change, communicate to the organization there's been a change, train to the change, and then retest to improve. So a failure to debrief and improve. And I've got on here. I um, said, so without this step, mistakes or areas of confusion may not be addressed. And this was in the Michigan State shooting. There's a lawsuit which comes and actually teaches uh, the Michigan State shooting, I believe, was February of this year. Um, teachers had made the educational leaders aware of the challenges with their plan and the fact that there were gaps, but the no action was taken, the notification was there, but they didn't go on to improve. Again, they were just, it maybe got lost in the sort of uh, the foray of all the things that people have to do, but the failure to debrief and improve. So when I did this webinar this week talking about schools, I spoke about those three pitfalls that I find in school emergency plans. And like I said, I think they're consistent and we see these in House of the Worst as well. So not covering all the scenarios. Remember, They'll do a scenario which is very structured, regimented, and most probably um, the expectation that the kids are in the classroom, so we're going to do the drill here. The worship centre is full, so we're going to do the drill here. They weren't considering transitioning areas and making it more complex. Uh, the second one was that there was an assumption that people knew the plan, that people knew what the expectation was. It was on the shared drive. Everyone's got a printed copy, but do they really know it? Do they? Can they recite it and tell you, this is my responsibility? And then the third one was a failure to debrief. And if they do debrief, what they're admitting to do is to improve the plan. The after action review identifies the changes. The changes make a change to the policy. That then gets communicated to people that has been a change. The, um, the, the change then gets trained. And then again, we then go back a series of testing. Does that new policy procedure now work? So those are the three things. So I would love your comments as you watch this back. Um, do you see those in your house of worship? Uh, as I mentioned, I, I spoke about them for schools, but I think they're very similar to churches as well. So I'd love your views and opinions 
Um, do you agree with what I've said? Do you disagree? Do you see those things in your house of worship? Um, before I leave you, because it is, uh, what is it, my time in California? Um, 4.20, I'm going to go and get some food in a little while once I made the changes to the book. I want to share with you, can I put this in here? Yeah, I want to share with you about the eighth annual um, securing your place of worship, which is now a virtual online conference. So if you are on my mailing list, we, we have been hitting this hard with the invitations, but I haven't actually come into a live video to talk about it. So I want to share some of my views. So for the last seven years in Minnesota, we've hosted an in-person event, which we call securing your place of worship. And actually, my friend Carl Chin, that's how I got to know Carl, was that he came to be one of the speakers uh, two or three years, I think, Carl has spoken. This year, I wanted to do something different. And uh, we have a great regional conference, but there's so many people in this group and so many people that I interact with which are outside of states and they can't get access to me or some of the speakers. So this year, we're doing the fully virtual conference. So it's going to be on Tuesday, September the 19th, 9 till 4. So there is a day program. If you are someone that works full-time in a church, if you are someone that works in facilities, you could be a full-time security director or someone in education. Um, sometimes when we do this on the weekend, I know that particular group don't always want to come on the weekend because they work Monday to Friday. So the Tuesday is great for you. And if you are part-time or volunteer, perhaps you can come along to a Tuesday as well. But there's a Tuesday day program, which is really inclusive of those that might work in a church full-time. And then on the Wednesday, we have a curriculum which is really geared um, primarily towards you as volunteers. So if you're a volunteer, we're trying to find some issues and subjects which are going to help grow you in your security journey. We would love for you to come to both days. But the great thing about doing it online as a virtual conference is that you can pick and choose which presentations that you come to. So your registration is open for both days. If there's something that you miss um, or something that you, doesn't necessarily resonate with you, you can go to the subject that does resonate with you. So Tuesday, September 19th, Wednesday, September 20th. And I want to quickly go through at a high level what some of the presentations are. So uh, Ginny Cronin is from uh, or Ginny Cronin is from Wagamaker and Overly. She is also my attorney who represents me as Kingswood, um, who is also the expert that I go to when it comes to legal matters. Uh, she's going to be looking at crisis management in worship spaces um, from a legal perspective. How do you manage in the crisis? How do you manage through the crisis? How do you manage post the crisis? And how do you sort of navigate those legal complexities, um, including um, um, not only social media, but in-person media and reputation management? What does that look like? One of the biggest risks that we have when we're in the house of worship is our reputational risk. It's very easy in some of our fences to lose the reputation of our community. Um, if you've been in the group for a while, some of you know that my good friend and fellow Brit, Dr. James Densley, is from the Violence Project. Dr. James Densley and his partner, um, Gillian Peterson, they have researched every mass shooting in the US from 1966 to the current day, of which I believe is now 191. And of those 191, 11 mass shootings have occurred in House of Worship. Um, James' is a database at the Violence Project is be, believed to be the most comprehensive in the US, far outweighs um, the FBI and any other federal agency. And actually, the state of Minnesota, the state of Minnesota gave his nonprofit $2 million this year to continue his work into active assailants, into understanding the causes behind mass shooting. So he's going to talk about not only research in his book, now he's going to talk about the active assailants within the church as, as to what we can learn. And there's four things that all these mass shooters generally have in common. I'm sure James is going to talk about that.
Now, my good friend and also a consultant on my Kingswood security team is the Reverend Tim Kingsley in the Episcopal Church. Now, um, incredible background. He has been at um, Columbia University, the head of public safety. Uh, he was a, uh, a volunteer first responder during 9-11, got 30 years in uh, physical security, um, and he took the call in, I think it was around five years ago, into ministry where he serves as the canon pastor for St. Mark's um, Episcopal Cathedral here in Minnesota. Uh, he is also on the board of directors for the Minnesota Crisis Intervention Team. So um, one thing that Tim is going to focus on is being crisis ready and how to develop resilient crisis intervention teams. The who, what, where, when, why, and how. How do you build those teams? Now, many of you know of this gentleman, Lieutenant Colonel Dave Graceman, needs no introduction. I'm really excited for him to speak at this virtual event because I talk to so many people that love his teaching, that love his education, and he's an incredible man. I think he is a once in a generation, he really is. Um, but Lieutenant Colonel Dave Grossman is going to join us on the second day. So this is the Wednesday now. He's going to join us as the keynote speaker, going through the Bulletproof Mind Sheepdog model for faith-based security teams. If you haven't seen him before and you've always wanted to, this is your opportunity. Uh, now, me with uh, minus a lot of hair, I am going to be going through the nonprofit security grant program and already the churches that we supported um, this past summer are now starting to have the awards rolling in. I think this year we've just, uh, just broken over $200,000 the churches that we helped have just been awarded. Uh, and different states release them at different times. A lot of people asking me about here in Minnesota. It's generally around a sort of September, October time we find out in Minnesota. Each state is different, but we've already helped churches this year get over $200,000. And I know where I am in Stockton, California, we'll be helping them as well. So I'm going to um, tell you that blueprint formula to how to be successful. If you haven't seen my webinar on that, um, we're going to be doing that sometime, most probably September time. I think it's on the calendar for, for January, but that's too late because most of you know that you need a security risk assessment before. So um, we're going to bring that, bring that forward. But I'm going to be talking about how to apply for a nonprofit security grant program. Uh, my friend, Jake Douglas, who also has a massive um, Facebook group. We've got about 6,000 people in his church administration group on Facebook. But his company, Church Finance Pros, um, he helped churches with their financial controls. And one of those is around embezzlement and how to safeguard and be good stewards of the money. So me and Jake recorded a podcast together around a month, uh, two months ago. Um, it is released. Maybe I'll drop that in a link as well to take a listen. And it's really important because if you get my weekly crime trends, you know that there is so much embezzlement that incurs in churches. And a lot of it is because they don't have the financial controls in place. So I'm really excited to have this presentation from Jake talking about safeguarding your church finances, all about the controls that you need to put in place. Uh, the last one, quickly highlight who's on the website is my friend Dan Cock. Now, Dan has appeared on the Worship Security Academy podcast two times, um, going through some of the teachings from his book, uh, his best-selling book, The Power of Me Leadership. Now, we are all, whether you're a volunteer, whether you are a staff member, we are all leaders in some, <coughs> excuse me, in some regards. And what Dan is going to take us through is, and I don't know, I haven't spoken to him yet, as to which tenant he's going to take us through, but you're going to take us through some um, learning on transformation leadership strategies that are going to help you in a church from his best-selling book, The Power of Me Leadership. So I'm really excited to have some leadership information on there. I'm going to go to the bottom here of the website now because there's some things that um, aren't on there as sort of keynotes or big presentations, but we've got Gary Eastwood. You might remember from CCW Safe, they also appeared on the Worship Security Academy podcast. I just need to drop all these links um, for you to take a look at, but <clears throat> excuse me. Gary is going to talk about the secrets or the myths, if you like, about concealed carry memberships. 
when Gary came on the podcast from CCW Safe, which is um, the membership that I prefer, so many people reached out and said, well, is this covered? Is that covered? What's the difference between US Law Shield and this other one? And I said to Gary, we're not here to necessarily promote CCW Safe, but we're here to talk about some of the secrets of these memberships and some of the key things that you need to safeguard yourself should you ever be in that situation where you need to use deadly force actually the church i'm i'm here in stockton had a conversation with someone this morning about what are those membership looks like so i know that's going to be uh, really sought after and then we've got a session that i call ask guy so my friend guy beverage free the founder of protectors um, toolkit and guy beverage and associates we're just going to do an open q a session so um many of you might know guy um he's also within a lot of the church um safety and security groups uh you'll be able to live time in the chat send a question and then guy who is a nationally recognized church security practitioner uh used to work for um stratagos so he's been in around church safety for uh, a long time like me does a lot of secular work as well he's going to give you some best practice and tips and tools in relation to a question that you ask him live time. So this isn't pre-recorded, he'll be there and you'll be able to ask him any questions that you like. I've been really excited for this. I met these two last week. Uh, Mike Lynch from Traders Point Church in Indianapolis and my good friend Wes Peterson from Eaglebrook Church here in Minnesota. Um, I can't remember where Mike said they were on their journey, but they now have Five or six, sorry, Mike, if I'm getting this wrong, five or six churches, multi site church. Uh, Wes Peterson, Eaglebrook has 11 or 12 churches. They're like the fifth largest church in the country. Now, when I bring security leaders like these two out, the response often is, well, that's all well and good because they're from multi million dollar nonprofits, multi site campuses. We're just a small church with 60 people. Both these guys started from zero. So remove the fact that they're from these large churches, they started with zero. My own personal church is around a $15 million nonprofit. We have four locations. In 2014, my good friend Jim Tice, who's our full-time security director, he started with one that I started to support him. Every program starts from ground zero. So these are two guys at large churches, but they if you're small and you're saying, well, how do they relate to me? They have been where you are. They have been where you are. So they're going to give a great sort of conversation about overcoming some church security obstacles. And I don't think I've got my notes here as to what some of those um, obstacles were, but we were on a, a call for about an hour running through some stuff and there's going to be some great information in there. And then obviously we're going to end that evening with Lieutenant Colonel Dave Grossman for about an hour and a half doing the keynote. So let me go back over here for a second, stop in this. So if you haven't yet secured your seat, would love for you to come to our eighth annual Securing Your Place of Worship, which is Tuesday the 19th and Wednesday the 20th of September, a fully virtual event. I would love for you to join us. But I've spoken much longer than what I intended to because I just wanted to come in and quickly um, talk to you. But if you have any questions that you would like us to cover in the upcoming podcast episodes, please reach out, let me know. Again, just going over some earlier stuff. If you would like to read in advance the book, How to Talk with Your Leader About Church Security, uh, please say the words book in the comments or send me a DM love to jump on a call, explain to you what it takes um, for you to help me with that research. And again, I went through earlier the sort of common pitfalls that I found in schools emergency operations plans when we help schools across the country. Love your views and opinions as to how they relate to you. And again, the eighth annual Securing Your Place of Worship event. If you are looking for a church conference, but you cannot get somewhere in person then this is a great event for you the link is below please consider joining us so um as i get ready to finish my feedback of my book and get ready to grab some food here in stockton california 
Uh, really appreciate you. We just reached a thousand people in this Facebook group. So uh, really grateful that you join this community of learning and education together. So for now, let me come back here. I will wish you a good Sunday evening and I shall talk to you soon. Take care, everybody.